Howdy. All right. Hey, we've got about two minutes before we're going to start here. It is family weekend, so we're, ex we're expecting a full house. With that being said, it's a lot easier if people kind of squeeze towards the middle. So when people come in, maybe a little later, they can come in on the side. So we would love for you to do two things here. I'm going to ask that, and when I say go, we're going to ask you that you stand and meet somebody around you and slide towards the middle. As you're meeting somebody, ask them how they enjoy the eclipse this week. So go ahead and stand and move towards the middle. <laughs> All right, howdy. howdy. There we go, there we go. Go ahead and grab a seat. Welcome, parents. Glad that you are here, and I uh, just want to let you know that we, we love having your students here. I have a student right now. My son is about to uh, shortly graduate from Texas A&M University, class 24. There we go, there we go which is awesome, right, parents? It's a great place to be. Uh, we just want you to know that we love having your students here. This campus is about probably 50% college students, and your kids add so much life and vitality and joy. We, we absolutely love having them here. So thank you for sharing them with us for uh, a few years and hopefully not too many years. Um, this morning, we are marking a, a really special moment in the life of our church. Uh, our, our literally longest ever serving staff member, Debbie Howard, is retiring. Oh. So Debbie started in 1984. Do the math real quick. Um, she, <laughs> Ten years old in case you couldn't uh, hear. Um, and I've been here over 30 years. So Debbie and I have been friends and coworkers for many decades, actually. And um, She's a great friend and a great coworker, and, and honestly, Grace Bible Church would not be where it is today without Debbie Howard. That is genuinely the truth. When we started, when, when she started here, we were across the street, and uh, our entire budget was about $300,000. Our now, what we give to missionary salaries it alone is almost double that. So, you know, we've moved from one campus to four campuses and a budget from 300000 to about $10 million over four campuses and 100 missionaries around the world. And Debbie has been the one who's managed our finances through that whole process. And she's done it with, with uh, excellence and with integrity, but also with, with vision. So, you know, Debbie figured out that the money is just a tool, right? God, through you, through your generosity, God gives us resources, and we just use those resources, hopefully, again, with wisdom and integrity so that we can help people um, 
figure out who Jesus is and come into a relationship with him and grow. And so the, the money's just a tool to get us there. But Debbie's done it in a way that, that has just been with absolute excellence and with integrity and with vision. And so Debbie, just so incredibly grateful for your friendship and being a coworker for all these years. Thanks, thanks, thanks. So for, for most of those years, How about that? I can hear me. Uh, for most of those years, I have, I'm Mike Chantry. I've served as a deacon or an elder since 1986 in one capacity or another. And one of my first deacon meetings in 1986, Debbie brought the budget to us and the financial statements. The total budget for the year would not get this church through one month now. But in all those years, we have acted with such great confidence at a leadership level in the church because we knew the accuracy and integrity of the financial information that Debbie brought to us. It's just been phenomenal. She's also a very dear personal friend. Her family's been here today to support her and we're gonna miss her here at the church but not in the community. She's not by any means finished with being a part of our fellowship. We'll get to celebrate some more with Debbie. I think she would like to share with you a little bit. Morning. I just wanted to say it has been a privilege. I have truly loved working here. The staff, we have a great staff. It's amazing. And I've had the privilege of working with elders, with deacons, with lay leaders, uh, fellows, uh, all the missionaries who I'm dearly, dearly, we just have awesome people. But I also appreciate all of y'all. Uh, just because if without your generosity and giving and being a part of our ministry, we, we couldn't do what we do. And so it's just been a privilege to see God's faithfulness over the years. That's been the hugest blessing for me because I just get to see God providing for every new vision, every new ministry, every new campus. I mean, it's been truly just a, a, a blessing to see God's work here. So thank y'all. Thank I'm sorry. I also wanted to say I did not do this alone. I had wonderful finance team, deacons and elders that work with me, finance elders. But Christine Martin has been working with me for about a little bit over five years, is going to be replacing me. She will do a fabulous job. I'm very confident in that. Trisha Tatum is going to be her assistant, but we... The finances are in good hands, so it'll be great. <laughs> Thanks, Deb. A final word, and we'll pray together. Thank you for letting us do this, Debbie. <laughs> she wasn't really excited about uh, being on the stage or having a reception, yeah. but uh, we twisted her arm, and we're so grateful that you let us do that. Let's pray. Father, as a church, we are just so grateful for Debbie and her service in our congregation for all these years. We... Uh, Thankful, thankful, thankful. We just, the blessings that you provided through her service have meant so much to this church. We thank you for her family who supported her as well. We just ask that you bless the years ahead, that they are abundant and fun, and that she gets to uh, enjoy the blessings that you brought to her. Father, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Debbie. So we continue in worship. We are going to celebrate a baptism this morning. And uh, here at Grace Bible Church, we believe that baptism is a really important step in our, our walk with Jesus. We believe that we are saved by grace through faith alone and Christ alone. It's a free gift. But uh, baptism is a moment when we get to stand in front of the body of Christ and say, uh, I have believed and I've given my life to Jesus Christ and I want to continue to walk with him. So we, we do immersion water baptism because we believe that that's the, appropriate to the symbol. The idea is this, that uh, the moment that you believe, you, you, you uh, experience the death of Jesus Christ on your behalf. So you, you die with him, going under the water, and then you're raised to new life with him. And this is a physical symbol of what's already transpired spiritually, and it's an opportunity to uh, proclaim the gospel and to pro proclaim our allegiance to Jesus Christ. So, Zach, I'll turn it over to you. There you go. So as Brian said, uh, the young lady that's coming today to be baptized has already placed her faith in Christ a while back and has been redeemed, bought by the precious blood of Christ, has been adopted as a daughter of the Most High God.
and is in the family we call the church. And so we're going to bring down, this is Lauren Hedinger, and she is a sophomore here at Texas A&M, and she's going to share a testimony. My walk with Christ was not linear. I grew up in a home that both feared and loved our God. When our home split in two, the Lord used it to bring me to a place to trust in God and develop fellowship with him. My mom has been one of my biggest supporters, and she supported me throughout my faith. When I was a kid, I only knew about him, but later, when I was leading a small group of kids through a kids program called Cove at my church, I realized I knew Jesus and I was walking with him. Since then, I've been able to further develop my faith and relationship with Jesus. The verse that I resonate the most with is from the parable of the prodigal son, Luke 15, 32. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. When I began college, I was lost with, more, with other worries and concerns. Since finding Grace Bible Church, I have no longer been lost, but yet found by Jesus Christ, who leads me on this journey next to him. For years, I was trying not to drown, consumed by the water that kept trying to drag me down, because I chose to do it all alone. Since then, I admitted I needed the Lord's help. I couldn't do it on my own. And now, I no longer feel like I'm drowning. Instead, I can stand strongly beside Jesus. I chose to be baptized today to make my own decisions with the Lord, and show that I'll walk beside him for the rest of my life and pull up, put all my faith in him. I'm blessed to have my mom here from Kentucky, who is crying in the corner to be here with me. <laughs> all right. Lauren, have you placed your faith in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins? I have. Then I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Would you pray with us? Father, thank you for Lauren. Thank you for the way that you have worked in her life and worked through her family. Thank you for the way that you have called her to this moment to proclaim the truth of who you are in her life. Thank you for the courage that she has to do so. And I pray for all of us that we would walk away today encouraged in our faith, blessed because of what she shared with us today, and remembering that you are a God who pursues us. You are a God who redeems. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand, church. God is so good and it's so wonderful to see someone go under the water and come back up again and say, I want to identify my life with Jesus. Be buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in new life. What a joy it is to see that on a Sunday morning. God bless you. We're so glad you're with us today. We start a new series this morning, and uh, even in the midst of what we're going to be talking about, as I prepared this week, I um, was drawn to just some places in Scripture that really got me thinking about how the evil one, our enemy, wants us to focus on ourselves. He wants us to focus on our flesh, and be wrapped up in ourselves so that we take our eyes off Christ, but we know from God's Word that those who are in Christ are a new creation. And that we are led by the spirit and not the flesh, not by fear, but rooted and grounded in love. And so I'm going to take us to scripture this morning as we prepare to worship and we get our hearts right. I just want to ask you as we read this verse together, that we would be challenged as we worship to not focus on our flesh, not focus on our bodies, but we'll be focused on the spirit that resides in us. We operate out of the spirit and not out of fear. Listen to what Paul reminds us of in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 as he's talking about fleeing from immortality or flee immorality, I'm sorry. And fleeing from sin. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you and whom you have from God and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And we're going to glorify God with our bodies and with our voices and our hands and our feet this morning as we come into his presence, as we minister to one another, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We're going to sing with conviction this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray um, that we would understand and be reminded this morning that we are not defined by our fears, and that we're not defined by our feelings, but that our identity 
is rooted and wrapped up in who you say that we are. And we stand on that truth this morning. And we declare that our identity is in Christ. And that we need not lean on the flesh. That they would lean on the spirit. That who you have set free is free indeed. So Lord, I pray that as we worship you this morning, that you would align our hearts to that truth. And Father, we give you every part of ourselves today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's sing together. Stand on his love together. Church, would you sing it with us? When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. Oh, I won't be shaken. Oh, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your Shame no longer has a place to hide And I am not captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken Oh, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance
up in Christ, not who this world says we are, not who we ourselves convince ourselves that we are sometimes. Our identity is in Him, church. We're chosen. I am chosen. trust in Jesus, his finished work on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, we can sing with confidence this morning. We're free indeed because of the shed blood of Christ on the cross. In just a minute, church, we're going to have our offering. Um, and as we just take a moment to just take a step back and say, Lord, thank you for how you have 
blessed me far beyond what I deserve. I give back a portion through the local church to what you're doing in this community and beyond. I'm going to pray for our offering and then we'll pass the baskets. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we sing with great joy, but also with great humility this morning, knowing that all that we have is from you. Apart from you, we can do nothing of any value. Lord, by your spirit, thank you that you inhabit our praise. Thank you that you are working and moving in this community. And Lord, we just, we pass the baskets not out of duty or out of obligation, but just in joy and gratitude for what you are blessing us with. And so we ask, Lord, that you'll bless um, this offering, this giving, and just use it, uh, multiply it in miraculous ways, and that we get to be a part of your work is just such a blessing. So thank you for that, Lord. In Christ's name we pray, amen. If you're in the center aisle here, there's a basket under your chair. If you would just grab that, pass it out towards the edges of the room and just take a minute, um, maybe in the quiet of your heart, just thank God for how he's blessed you. And um, we'll continue in worship in just a second. give life. Let's sing. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Sing great. Great. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only oh, oh. sing that verse again you give life you give life I love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken it's oh and great are you Lord it's your every voice. Let every voice lift his praise together. All the earth is singing. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you Lord. All the sing. In our lungs, 
pray. Father, thank you for that reminder that absolutely everything that we have is a gift from you, even the breath that is in our lungs, the, the strength that we have in our bodies to offer praise back to you is a gift from you. And I pray, Father, that the meditations of our heart in the next few minutes as we're in your word together would be pleasing to you, would be honoring to you, that they would be uh, consistent with who you are and what you've declared about yourself and about us. I pray, Father, that we would be uh, expectant, eager to listen to the voice of your spirit. And I pray, Father, that in a really significant way, each of us would, would leave here uh, more fully conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay, as Corby said, we are starting our new series this week on uh, gender and sexuality. We've talked about gender and sexuality over the next four weeks. And uh, if during the course of this sermon series you have uh, a question um, that maybe I can, um, hold on, there we go, that maybe I can integrate into the sermon series, or we're also going to do a panel discussion twice. First panel discussion is going to be on Wednesday, April 24th, 7 to 9 p.m. We'll have a couple staff members, a couple local counselors, so maybe I can integrate the, some of the questions into the panel discussion or into the sermon. You can just click on that uh, QR code. Um, you know, this, this can be, a, a, I would say, a challenging series, but I think really, really important and um, valuable for us. And to kind of give you a framework of, of how I plan on approaching this, we'll spend some time each week talking about what the world says to us about the topic, and then discuss what does God's word say? And then how do we respond as people who, who are followers of Jesus Christ and we live in this world but we're not of this world, how do we, how do we live out our faith in both uh, truth and love? And how, how do we do both? How do we live out in truth and love when a culture is moving away from God and we're called to be salt and light in the earth? How do we do that? So it's kind of the framework for uh, where we're gonna be going each week. But let me start with a question, a really simple question, and that is, who are you? Who are you? And how do you answer that question? Or more fundamentally, what does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to be a human? And where do you go to actually answer that question? Uh, you know, a lot of times when you ask somebody, who are you, they, they answer with what they do. So they'll say, I am a pastor, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm a teacher. Um, whatever, which is not an answer of who you are. That's an answer of what you do, right? It's not who you are, it's what you do. Or sometimes people will answer with uh, who they're related to or connected to. So I am Tristy's husband, I'm Ben and Anna Joy's dad. Well, that's not who I am, but that is who I'm significantly related to. And what I've noticed uh, increasingly in our culture, when you ask somebody who they are, where they go is they go to a statement of gender or sexuality. So I am he, him, I am, she, her, I am straight, gay, lesbian, trans, right? Sexuality has now become one of the, the dominant frameworks that people think when they think of their identity, who they are. So uh, who are you and how do you know who you are? Interesting timing. Just this last week, both the president and the pope made a statement about who you are. Right? Both the pope and the president made a statement about gender and sexuality, a statement about fundamental human identity. So who do you listen to? The Pope or the President or your parents or your pastor? See what I did there? Four Ps. I worked really hard on that. So let's just acknowledge because <laughs> I don't often alliterate. We had four Ps, right? Or do you listen to your friends? Do you listen to social media? Do you listen to the voice that's inside of you telling you something? How do you know who you are? Uh, during the course of the series, I'm going to recommend to you several books. Uh, first one I want to recommend to you is by Nancy Piercy. It's called Love Thy Body. And in Nancy Piercy's book, she provides a, a conceptual framework for how people think of their identity, whether consciously or unconsciously. And she talks about uh, the, the human person, in a sense, as two floors to a house. On the first floor, the worldview is modernism. That's the realm of the objective, of science, of biology, of facts. In the modernistic worldview, you are your body. You are matter. The only thing that really matters is matter. What, what is eternal is matter. So you might have this sensation that you had this thing called an emotion, but all that it was was a biochemical reaction. 
So it's very reductionistic. The human person is just a body. On the second floor, the worldview is uh, postmodern. That's the realm of the subjective of psychology and theology and ethics and feelings. It's what's internal. So who you are in a postmodern worldview is who you feel you are and nothing else, which is also reductionistic because what they're saying in a postmodern worldview is your body is irrelevant to your identity. And it doesn't matter if the two don't align with one another. And one of the challenges for us in the world that we're living in, and I would say especially for you who are students, is you frequently move back and forth between these two worldviews, not just on a daily basis, but sometimes on an hourly basis, right? You go to chemistry class, or you go to finance class, you go to calculus class, and the lecture is right in the middle of a modernistic worldview. It's objective. This is reality. And your prophet, prof gives, knowingly or unknowingly, a lecture that is in a modernistic worldview. And then you step out of your classroom and you open up your phone to Instagram or TikTok or if you're over 30, Facebook, <laughs> and you're right in the middle of a postmodern worldview. And your prof who just gave that lecture with a modern worldview might actually in his life live with a postmodern understanding of reality. And so we move back and forth between the two, but I would say culturally the predominant worldview is postmodern. In a postmodern worldview, who you are is who you feel you are. That's it. What you think about yourself and feel about yourself defines your identity, and everyone else around you has the responsibility to validate and affirm who you feel you are at any, at any given point in time. That's the world that we live in right now. So maybe you're asking yourself, why are we talking about this in church? And I know that some of you are thinking that because some of you have said that to me. <laughs> Brian, why are we talking about this in church? Can't we just milk a few more sermons out of Romans, right? <laughs> and then I've had others of you who say, I wish we weren't talking about this, but I really am glad we're talking about this because we need to talk about this. This is the world that we're living in. So why are we talking about this? Well, uh, we are a Bible church, Grace Bible Church. And what that means is we believe that the Bible that you're holding in your hands is the word of God, and that it's authoritative for our lives. It's authoritative define, to define not only who God is, but who we are. And if you open up your Bibles to page one, there's a declaration from God about who you are. And what you're going to see is that uh, God cares from page one about your identity, he cares about your sexuality, he cares about your attractions, he cares about your singleness, he cares about your marriage, he cares about all of your relationships, because he cares about you. And because he designed you, he, his definition of who you are is accurate to who you actually are. And what he wants for you is to experience the, the fullest and most satisfying life you could possibly experience, but that only happens when you live consistent with his design for you. So, who does God say that you are? I want you to listen to David's words in Psalm 139. He wrote, For you, Lord, formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a masterpiece of God's design. And you will experience the fullest and richest, most satisfying life when you live consistently with who God says that you are. So, Let's go all the way back to the beginning and unpack this a little bit more. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. What does it mean to be a person? Who are you? Genesis 2 verse 7 says, The Lord God formed the man from the soil of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So, notice, you are both physical and spiritual. The Lord God formed from the soil of the ground, from the dust of the earth, from matter, the same matter that everything exists in and from. He made a physical body from the dust of the ground, the soil of the ground, and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, or that is life that comes from God. He breathed into this flesh, this body, spirit, and then there was a person. That is, you are material and immaterial. You are physical and spiritual. 
you are both. You're not just your body and you're not just a spirit. To be a person means to be physical and to be spiritual, to be both. That is, in a biblical worldview, the first floor and the second floor are integrated into one. If there's a separation or a disintegration between the two, that's something that's broken. You are both, physical and spiritual. Now, another book that I'm going to recommend to you is by uh, Sam Alberry. What does God have to say or what God has to say about your bodies? In that book, he wrote this. He said, God didn't first make a soul called Adam and then look around for something physical to put that soul into as though the soul was the real Adam and his body was the equivalent of a Tupperware container to store it in. No, God actually started with matter. Did you notice that in the created order? He goes to the dust of the ground and he makes the physical being first. Then he breathes life into that physical being because only God has life in himself and he gives life from himself to Adam. And when God's life enters the physical being, there is in Hebrew what's called a nephesh or a soul or a person. Now you have a person. For the point of this discussion, what I'm trying to get across is this, your body matters in terms of who you are. Carl Truman uh, makes the same, similar point. He writes, our bodies are an integral part of who we are. And I do not occupy my body as I might occupy a house or a spacesuit or a deck chair at the beach. On the contrary, it is an integral part of me, inseparable from who I am. Therefore, Your body is you, but so is your spirit. You're not just a body or just a spirit. You're spirit and body. And my point is this. You are actually made by God's design to inhabit two realms simultaneously. You're designed by God to inhabit the physical realm and the spiritual realm simultaneously. Listen to Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. And some of you are saying, well, Brian, you you just need to stay in your lane. Just talk about spiritual life. Well, you can't talk about the spiritual life without talking about the physical life. Is this verse about the spiritual life or the physical life? The answer is yes, right? Do you not know that your body, physical, flesh and bone, is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? That is spirit, Whom you have from God, you are not your own, therefore you were bought with a price. Glorify God with your body, in your body. Everything you do, spiritually, you do in the context of your body. So, glorify God. In other words, you're not just your body, but your body is necessary in identifying who you are. There would be no Adam without a body. There would be no Eve without a body. There wouldn't have been you without a body. It's a part of of who you are. So God's design is that the material and immaterial are integrated into one person. So what happened? Well, God began to create. And he created birds in the skies and fish in the sea, and he created plants, he created all kinds of things. And then on the sixth day, he came to the very pinnacle of his creation, and he made what he described as man. And about man, he would say, man was made as the pinnacle of his creation in his image. That's true of of no other part of creation. Only mankind is made in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So, Your body is necessary for you to image God on earth. Not only is your body necessary for you to image God on earth, your male body or your female body is necessary for you to image God on earth. The image of God was not fully reflected on earth until there was both male and female, equally made in the image of God. So, what does it mean to be in the image of God? I would argue this is absolutely one of the most foundational concepts theologically in the Bible. I'm going to give you four characteristics of what it means to be made in the image of God. The first is this. Because we are in the image of God, we can relate to God and relate to others. That is, we can have a personal relationship with God that bears can't have and fish can't have and a plant can't have. We can have a personal relationship with God and we can have a personal relationship with one another. 
because we were made in the image of God. John 17, verse 3, Jesus is praying, but he's wanting his disciples to listen to him talk to his Father. And he said this, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And Jesus says, this is, the, this is the essence of life. This is what you were designed for. When he says eternal life, he's not talking simply about life that goes on for a long time. Eternal life is a quality of life. It, God's life, and he's the, remember, he's the only one who has, who has life in himself. God's life is, by definition, eternal life. No beginning, no end. This is life from God. And so what does it mean for a person to be alive or have life? It means they're in relationship with the Creator. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent, through whom they can have relationship with you. That's the nature of life, to be in relationship with the Creator, but also to be in relationship with one another. So remember, God's creating, and at the end of the day, he says, it is good. Stars in the heaven, that's good. Beasts in the field, that's good. Plants in the field, that's good. It's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then he creates Adam on the sixth day, pinnacle of his creation. And he starts working with Adam. He goes, ah, something's not good here. This is not good for man to be alone. And he makes man a helper comparable to him because it's not appropriate for Adam to not be in relationship with one who is like him but different from him. Now, this doesn't mean that every single one of us will, will, will get married um, and in order to get married, you have to, you know, you have to reflect the image of God through marriage. Uh, Jesus never got married. Paul never got married. In a couple weeks, we're going to talk about marriage and singleness. You can still reflect the image of God and not be married, but you can't be in isolation from other people and still reflect the image of God fully as God designed it. We reflect God's image, in a sense, together through our relationships, in relationship with God, in relationship with one another. Second, because we are in the image of God, we reflect God's glory in our character. Now, uh, the word glory in Hebrew, kavod, it means literally something that's heavy or weighty. Metaphorically, then, it's something that's important or valuable. So we're told that God is glorious, that is, he is important or valuable. And the biblical writers begin to use the word glory as shorthand to talk about the sum total of all of God's perfections. Right? God is glorious, or the glory of God is shorthand for saying God is perfect in his attributes. His, he's perfect in his personality. And what he's done is he's created you so that you can reflect God's personality on earth. Right? God's perfections on earth. You can be like God. Now, uh, I'm not sure if uh, any of you traded in your glasses this week. Right? Did you get your... Uh, Anybody, anybody go out and look at the eclipse? Okay, good. Almost everybody. Uh, anybody um, get in your car and drive so that you could be in the path of the totality? Anybody? Okay, so more nerds at 11 than 9. <laughs> Just kidding. I really wanted to get in the path of the totality. Pat and I talked, Pat Coyle and I talked about it, but we couldn't get out of a meeting, so we had to just go outside, and we got, you know, 98%. Of, of the eclipse right out here. The clouds parted for a little while. We got to look up. We got to see it. It was just really, really super cool. It was amazing, right? And, and the great thing is uh, the world didn't end like we were told it was going to, right? We're, we're still here. So what happened during the eclipse? Not a trick question. What happened? The moon came in between the sun and the earth, right? So what did you experience? It got dark. And outside here, it actually dropped a few degrees, it's crazy. Why? Because the moon has no light in itself. It has no light in itself. On a clear night, you look up and you see the moon, and it's bright because it's reflecting the sun. It doesn't have light in itself. What we do is we can reflect the beauty and the brilliance of God when we love justice and we show mercy and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, we are reflecting the character of God like no other creature can. Now, third, to be made in the image of God means that we can radiate his glory in our form. 
The word image occurs 17 times in the Old Testament. In all but two of those times, it's referring to something physical. Right? Image is a body. Image is physical. So remember when Nebuchadnezzar, in the book of Daniel, it says he set up an image. That is, he set up a form, a physical form, in a sense that would represent him in his beauty and glory in his absence. Well, God has done that with us. He's given us a form that's appropriate to this domain in which we live, which is also physical, but he's given us a form that actually can radiate his beauty. Another understanding of glory is actually the, the beauty of God. So, listen to Exodus 34, verse 29. It says, it came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with God. That's a crazy verse, right? Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and he's been with God for 40 days, but it's just him and God. And God has pulled back the veil a little bit of his glory and so Moses is interacting with God in a sense, face to face. He's, he's, he's seeing the beauty and brilliance of, of God. And then when he comes down, God's glory has, has become embedded in his physical being, so much so that when he walks down, the Israelites see him and they go, whoa, that's kind of spooky. You're, you're almost too beautiful, Moses, to look at. Could you cover that up? And so what would he do? When he would go in to be with the Lord in the tent, from then on, he'd pull back the veil and he would just, he would interact with God face to face, so to speak, but then he'd come out and he'd pull down the veil because it was just Overwhelming, God's glory had, had actually become radiated out through his physical being. And that's what you and I were designed for. On the Mount of Transfiguration, it says, Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light, because Jesus had been in the presence of his Father. His disciples looked at him, and they're like, whoa, whoa. That's beautiful. And right now you may look in the mirror and say, I don't see that. But you will. You've, given a form, you've been given a form, a physical form, that can receive and radiate the beauty of God. We're told that in Daniel chapter 2, verse 3, that we will literally shine like the stars of the heavens. Because we're made in the image of God. Fourth, because we're in the image of God, we can represent God's purposes on earth. We can represent his purposes, his will, his intentions, his desires. Listen to these words from David in Psalm chapter 8, verses 3 through 6. He says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. That is, David has gone out into the field and he's just looking up at the sky and he sees the stars and he sees the moon, he sees the vastness of God's creation, God's intelligence and his power. And he looks at all this and he says, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? He says, I look out at all these star stars and I think I'm just this tiny speck in this vast universe. Why do you even think about me? That doesn't make sense to me. And yet you have made mankind, you have made us a little lower than God and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. When I look at the stars in the sky and I see the moon and I think about that, that there's galaxy after galaxy after galaxy and it's so vast, I can't even imagine why you would take any concern for someone so small and puny like me. And yet, what you've done is you've made us a, just a little lower than God and you have commissioned us to rule and reign over all of your creation. Wow. What is that an echo of? Genesis chapter 1, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule and reign. What that means is... We put things in order. We keep things in order. Like the creator, we create and we make things. We make ideas and we make beauty and we make forms and we make music because that's a reflection of the creator exercising his will upon the earth. And we do it in relationship with him. We do it in relationship with one another. We do it consistent with his character. And we're the only creatures that have been commissioned to do so. Now, what that means is your body matters, okay? He's given you a form that is consistent with you fulfilling his image in this space. You've been given a physical body because we live in a physical universe, 
so that we can physically and spiritually reflect the image of God in his character, in his beauty, in his will. In other words, you're amazing. <laughs> if you're taking notes, just write that in right now, right in your journal. I'm amazing. You are amazing. You are the, the pinnacle of God's creation, his greatest design in his image. Also, you are fatally flawed. You're also broken. I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. And maybe you've noticed that uh, we've been in Genesis 1 and we've been in Genesis 2 and now we're going to be in Genesis 3. There's uh, so much you can understand about your identity in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Okay, Genesis chapter 3. Let's read together in verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So what was the serpent's intention? His intention was to drive a wedge between God and the creatures made in his image. He was tempting the creatures made in his image, Adam and Eve, man and woman, to believe that they could experience a better life independently from God. That's, that's autonomy, which literally means self-rule, self-governance. Our lives will be better if we are independent from God, if we are separate from God. The problem is this. Uh, there is no life outside of God, right? Only God has life of, in and of himself. We are, we're what's described as contingent beings, meaning we are dependent upon God for life itself. There is no life apart from God. They're tempted to believe they have a better life apart from God, but there is no life apart from God. So what did they experience? When they separated themselves from God, they experienced death. They begin to experience death, which means separation, right? Death doesn't mean cessation of existence. It means they begin to experience separation from God, or uh, alienation, we might say, because they're no longer deriving their life moment by moment from God. They are alienated from God. They experience spiritual death because God is spirit. They also experience uh, alienation from one another. Right before, there's no barriers between them. There's complete transparency. And now they experience shame, and they pull back. They have alienation with one another. Person to person, what, what were we made for? We were made for life with God and life with one another. Now there's an alienation there. There's a separation there. They're beginning to experience what is uh, death. And then there's fear between them, and there's shame between them, and then there's anger, and there's hatred, and one son kills another son, and we have wars, and bonds are being thrown. Right? There's alienation to people. That's not God's design. They also experience alienation from creation itself because God made creation good. He made it to produce its abundance for us so there'd never be scarcity, but just uh, ease in our relationship with the earth. And now we have what's described as thorns and thistles, right? Work is hard. And it's not always rewarding. And sometimes you're frustrated with your coworkers or your employees or your boss. And you can't make quite enough to pay off your debts, to get a little bit into retirement, to pay your kids' school bills, right? It's just kind of frustrating. There's alienation between us and earth. You buy a house, 
and it looks great, and then the air conditioner breaks, and you have hail damage, and insurance doesn't come through, and then you find there's mold in the walls, and you got to tear down the sheetrock, and it's just like, oh my gosh, this is a broken, fallen world, right? There's alienation between us and earth. There's also an alienation that they experience in and of themselves, right? So Adam and Eve begin to experience death or separation, alienation, and then they gave it to every single generation. So we experience that as well. And they experience an alienation, in a sense, from themselves. Uh, Listen again to these words in verses 7 and 8. It says, They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Why did they make fig leaves, sew them together, and, and explicitly cover up their loins? Because they are ashamed of their bodies. Right? And think about it. They, they were physically perfect. But because of sin, they are alienated from themselves. They are ashamed of their own bodies, right? So we experience alienation from ourselves. Spiritually, our minds don't reason correctly to get us to the right conclusion all the time. Our wills are weak and we don't follow through on what we wanna follow through on. Our conscience doesn't always guide us to the thing that is true and right. Our emotions don't always correspond to reality. Instead, we feel fear and anxiety and depression. Sometimes the depression is so bad you don't wanna get out of bed. Right, we're alienated from ourselves spiritually. We're also alienated from ourselves physically. I've never known a single person who says, my body is perfect, right? 10, 10, look at me. Don't, don't be jealous, but right here, this is it. I'm, I am all that, the whole, the whole package right here. Perfect 10, completely satisfied with absolutely everything. Ever known anybody who ever said that? Absolutely not. I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too tall, I'm too short, I'm too male, I'm too female. See where we're going? We're alienated from ourselves. We're dissatisfied from ourselves. And the first floor and the second floor aren't lining up because of sin. Because we live in a broken world. And so the result is, We can't fully enjoy our relationship with God. We can't fully enjoy our relationship with one another. We can't fully enjoy ourselves and be satisfied with ourselves because of death, because of sin, because we are fatally flawed. Now, that's not where the story ends, right? We will also be fully restored. We will also be fully restored. We are living in a broken world but we will be fully restored. We will be fully restored spiritually. We will be fully restored physically. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27 says, this is the Lord speaking. He says, moreover, I will give you a new heart. That's spiritual. I'm gonna give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. So what happened when Adam and Eve sinned is that their, the, the inner man, the immaterial man, the spirit within Adam and Eve became separated from the spirit of God. And since there's only life in God, only God has life in himself, they experienced spiritual death. God says, you know what, that's not what you were designed for. So what's gonna happen when I rescue and redeem all things is I'm gonna put my spirit inside of you. And I'm gonna give you a new heart that is your inclinations will now always be toward things that are true and honorable and right and life-giving. You're never gonna be inclined any longer toward the lusts of your flesh which destroy you. You're not gonna be torn. You're not gonna be alienated from yourself. You're gonna be whole spiritually and your mind is gonna reason correctly and your emotions are gonna be corresponding to reality and your conscience is gonna work perfectly and your will won't be weak. It will execute what is good and true and right At all points in time, your spirit will be united with the spirit of God and you will be healed. You will be whole. So you will be fully restored spiritually and also be fully restored physically. Romans 8, Paul writes, we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit, 
We groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. So here's the gospel. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. This is what you were made for. Uh, you have sin, I have sin. We're born separated from God, but Jesus died to pay the penalty of those sins which create the alienation or the separation. The moment you believe in Jesus, that debt of sin is removed so you're no longer alienated. Instead, you have the life of God inside you. You begin to experience eternal life or God's life inside of you. And what God does is he puts his spirit inside of you. What Paul says is the spirit uh, is given to you in a sense like first fruits. Or in another place, he'll use the word literally, it's a down payment. You begin to experience the life of the Spirit inside of your spirit. And that's what gives you hope that your body also will be redeemed. If God redeemed you spiritually, he will also redeem you physically. That is, right now you're groaning in your body. Why? Because <laughs> age and decay and sickness and disease and eventually death and, you know, it, the body just it betrays you, it's, it's corruptible, it wears out. But you know what? Someday you're gonna get a glorified body. And a glorified body, we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, doesn't grow old, it doesn't decay, it is regenerated and it becomes healthier, wholer, and stronger. And it is glorious in that it can reflect and radiate the very beauty of God. That's the body that you are going to receive. Now, what will it look like specifically? Philippians chapter 3, and then 1 John chapter 3, if you want to look up that one later, it says, the Lord Jesus Christ will transform the body of our humble state, current body, look in the mirror, kind of dissatisfied, right, into conformity with the body of his glory. Think about of transfiguration. You're going to get a body like that. Physically healthy forever, not degenerating, and a spirit that is healed and whole. Yeah. Not only this, but because you've been given the Spirit right now as a down payment or a pledge or the first fruits of the Spirit, God is now currently restoring your spirit in the context of your body. Your spiritual life is all lived out in the context of your body, and God is restoring you spiritually right now as you listen to God's Word as you reflect on God's word, as you look at Jesus, as you're with people who are like Jesus, he's transforming you spiritually. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. You see all, you see all those allusions there? A lot of illusions there, right? We all with unveiled face. What's that an allusion to? Moses going into the, the, the tabernacle and pulling back the veil and seeing God face to face. We all with unveiled face. That is, reading the word and thinking about Jesus and meditating upon Jesus and praying and being with people who are like Jesus and want to be like Jesus. We are beginning to slowly gaze into the face of the Lord and his glory, his personality, his beauty, is being formed in us. Jesus is, we're told in Colossians 1.15, the perfect image of the invisible God. He is, this, he is what God had designed intentionally for mankind to be, right? So the eternal son of God took on flesh and blood. He took on a body, a physical body, a physical body that he still has to this day. And he took that physical body on so that he could reflect and radiate and show us this is what it looks like for a human person to be all that God designed them to be. And what is God doing in you right now? He is molding you and making you and transforming you into the image of Jesus Christ. That is, he's restoring the image of God inside of you as you listen and learn and you walk with Jesus. And he's doing that all in the context of this physical world that we live in, in the physical bodies that we live in. There's not a separation between the two. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 Verse 31, Paul says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, what, what's, what's, what's he mean? Well, that's just kind of basic. What do you do every day? Well, I eat and I drink. He says, whether you eat or drink or really, you know, whatever you do, do it in a way that reflects who God is. 
radiates his beauty and his glory to the people around you, who represents his will and his intentions in your relationships and in your family and in your community. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do with your body, do all of it to the glory of God. The point being, uh, your body matters. Your body matters in sanctification. Your body matters now. Your body matters forever because it will be redeemed and restored. You're not just your body, but your body is a significant component of your identity, who you are. Now, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. First Corinthians 6, verse 12. There's a start in verse 13. It says, food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? What is he saying? He, he's saying, your body doesn't just belong to you. It belongs to the Lord. And the Lord has made your body for himself. And he's made it for a specific purpose. And why has he given you the body? So you can glorify him in your body. That's why he's given you a body. Verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So what is God doing right now in your life? He's healing you spiritually in the context of your body. And both matter. Your spirit matters to God and your body matters to God. And for you to be healthy and whole, the body and the spirit are integrated into one. And when they're disintegrated or there's a conflict between the two, there's something there that needs to be healed. And I know for some of you, even hearing, because I got, I got email mails and I got text messages, phone calls, it just the fact that we're bringing up this topic, for some of you, you go, man, this makes me really nervous and uncomfortable. And for some of you, you walk into this moment and you're carrying in a lot of shame and guilt. And I want to tell you, that is 100% the enemy. Okay? That is 100% the enemy. The enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. The creator of the universe can take the most broken parts of your experience in this life and bring healing. The creator of the universe can make beauty out of ashes, right? The ashes are, man, something got burned down. And there may be things that people did to you or decisions you made, things that you did to yourself. And I'm telling you right now, God can heal those things. And God can heal them to the point that he can use those things to create beauty in your life and through your life into the lives of other people. And the enemy will want you to pull back and to, and to be ashamed and to be like Adam and Eve and retreat from one another and retreat from God. And what God is saying is, yeah, I, want, I want to step into your life and I want to bring healing in that deepest and most vulnerable part of your soul that you're afraid to even talk about. That's what God does. That's what he touches. And you can start fresh every single day. Every single day, his mercies are fresh and new. And what you do is you say, God, I am yours. Every morning, I am yours. My body is yours and my spirit is yours. All of me is yours. I belong to you. And what he does is he redeems Redeem, meaning he buys back, right? He buys back what you gave away. He buys back what someone took from you and stole from you. He buys it back and he says, this is mine. This is why Jesus came. You belong to me, body and spirit. He buys it back and he creates healing for you in the innermost part of your being. And all that you have to do is every day you say, I'm yours. Keep healing. Spirit, just keep healing. It doesn't happen in a moment, it happens over a lifetime, but he does, he keeps healing. Because that's what the creator of the universe can do. He can make beauty out of absolute brokenness if you let him. You don't have to be here sitting in shame and guilt. Because Jesus loves you and you belong to him. Every single part of you. Romans chapter 12. We've looked at this now a few times, right? Our study of Romans. It reads like this. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies, a living and a holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So is this verse, is it about your body or your spirit? Yeah, right. It's about you as a person. Because if you're a person made in the image of God, you're spiritual and you're physical. 
Now, if you've ever noticed, but just about every verse that's uh, discussing worship is, uh, is physical. You ever notice that? Lift up your hands in prayer. Bow your head. Bend your knees. In Hebrew, you know, the word for worship actually literally means fall down. Fall down. Why? Because when you fall down, you can only look up. And you realize, "Ah, I'm not really all that. But God is. When I consider the heavens, the stars, the moon, the works of your hands, I say, what am I? Just puny and small little speck in the universe. And then I realize, you care about me, God, and you love me, and you see me. And we humble ourselves, and he exalts us and says, you're valuable. You matter to me body matters to me, your spirit matters to me, you matter to me, your emotions matter to me, your sexuality matters to me, the brokenness in you matters to me. Every aspect of who you are matters to me and I'm redeeming it for myself, I'm buying it for myself because you belong to me, I bought you and I wanna make you whole. And what I want you to do is just keep offering yourself every day and let me heal you. And so my encouragement for you during this series is just to, to make that your practice every day and when the enemy whispers to you, you're not worthy, you're broken, you got all this history, things done to you, things you did to yourself, you say, not true, I belong to Jesus. Right, not true, I belong to Jesus. I gave him my, my, my entire person to him, I gave him my spirit, I gave him my body, I gave him myself, I gave it to him this morning and I gave him to him at 9 a.m. and noon, I just keep giving it to him. He, I belong to Jesus, I don't belong to your lies, Satan, and you need to begin to practice believing what God says about you and not believing the lies of the enemy about you. Okay, that's my challenge to you, my encouragement to you, as we move through this series. So where do we go from here? Uh, I do want to give you resources as we move through this. There's a lot of stuff that's been written. I'm not gonna tell you I agree 100% with anything that, or everything that somebody wrote, but here are a couple good places to start. First, Nancy Piercy, Love Thy Body. She's really good at just framing worldview. How do people think about themselves? How should you think about yourself? Sam Albury, what God has to say about our bodies. Really great timing for us. Philip Bethencourt at Central invited Sam to speak Saturday evening, April 20th, 6 to 8. That's, that's I me mean, like, wow, what a great gift. That'll be a really interesting and useful time if you can make it. Um, I told Philip we, we would have about 1,000 people joining him for that. And then we're going to do two panel discussions. First will be April 24th, 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, again, if you have a question, use the QR code. Send it in, um, and I'll see if I can work that in. Now, as we're closing, I would ask you to stand with me. And uh, we are going to read together Psalm 139. You can read it loud, you can read it soft, just read it uh, out loud together. For you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, would you bow your heads, close your eyes, and as you do so, uh, remember, worship is, is uh, frequently discussed uh, in very physical terms because uh, the postures of our bodies, uh, it can reflect what's going on in our hearts, right? If we're raising a fist toward God, we're angry, if we're lifting up our eyes and we're, we can be proud, we bend the knee or we bow our heads, we're humbling ourselves. So sometimes it reflects what's going on in our heart, but also when you move your body, it can direct your heart in a certain direction. So one of the prayer practices of the, the Quakers is they would start a prayer, uh, palms facing upward. So as your, your eyes are closed and your head is bowed, I want you to just, both hands in front of you, palms facing upward. I want you to turn your hands down, palms facing downward. And their idea was this, as you turn your palms over, uh, release. Release anger and fear and guilt and shame. Release sin that's been confessed and forgiven by Jesus. Just release it and give it to the Lord. So take a moment and release everything that's on your, burdening your heart right now to the Lord. Turn your palms facing up and receive. Receive his grace and his mercy and his goodness and his kindness.
Jesus, thank you that your grace is greater than all of our sin and brokenness. Jesus, thank you that you came to set us right in our spirit and in our body. Thank you that we have hope that both will be redeemed and rescued. Thank you that you are at work in us right now, overcoming shame and guilt and fear and making us whole. Thank you that we can more fully reflect your image tomorrow than we have today and the day after. Thank you that even though we're just these tiny specks in the universe, you see us and you think about us and we, we're valuable to you, that we matter. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life so that we could have life. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Church, let's close and worship and sing together. I've got a friend closer than a brother. There is no judgment. Oh, how he loves me. I've got a friend. And he is my strength. He is my portion. With me in the valley, with me in the fire, with me in the storm. Let all my life testify. Hallelujah. We are not alone. God really
Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have not left us alone. You've not left us alone to wander around and try and figure out who we are, but you've told us. What you've told us is that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We are, we're a masterpiece of your creation. And those parts of us that are broken, you're healing. You've not left us alone. Father, I pray this week that we go out with just a great sense of confidence and, and joy and, and contentment that we belong to you and you see us and you know us just as we are. Father, we thank you that you've accomplished this for us through the incredible sacrifice of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray, amen. All right, God bless you. You guys go out, be amazing this week. We'll see you next week.